once again, guys, um, welcome to another session of computer architecture. As you um, already know, we're looking at motherboards today as far as uh, module content is concerned. So we've been discussing um, computing, obviously, in, in that, or the computer system in, in, in the generic sense also breaking down the different components that make up any given uh, computer system. So I think in our very first session, we discussed the whole uh, differences between hardware and software, and arguably how each one of those components are obviously interrelated to the other. I think we've been mentioning this for um, uh, lectures on end now, uh, stating that obviously the most sophisticated software is, is, is ultimately useless without the appropriate hardware to function it and vice versa. And if you remember, what we also mentioned is that um, any given computing component should naturally be able to undertake uh, those five distinctive things uh, before it can be successfully labeled as a machine. So remember, we mentioned the fact that a computer system is any electronic calculating device, which means that it can range from your most basic pocket calculator to arguably the most sophisticated machine that you can imagine. But those five things that we were mentioning before you can label any electronic device as a computer is the input, uh, your process, output, uh, storage, and obviously eventually connection or some kind of connectivity to uh, any uh, distinctive given network. So we also discussed um, the other components such as your central processing unit. And uh, like we mentioned before, that uh, a central processing unit typically mimics the brain of the machine. A uh, bit of an overstatement, but it gives you an idea of what that distinctive component is uh, uh, responsible for. So everything that the machine does has to literally uh, go through the central processing unit. So uh, remember, we mentioned the whole concept of executioning of you know, execution rather of instructions uh, or executing instructions. Uh, these instructions obviously can be very simplistic: um, the switching on of the computer system, double clicking on an icon or ultimately also looking at uh, working out uh, uh, very complex equations, just for argument's sake. So those instruction sets, like we mentioned before, need to be out somewhere before they can be executed. And typically what we uh, discussed was RAM, which is your random access memory, a volatile type of architecture that is responsible for housing uh, at those uh, uh, storage, all those uh, um, instruction sets before they can be ultimately executed by the central uh, processing unit. And then uh, also subdivision of your, your, your secondary storage, uh, looking at your, your hard drives, optical media, and flash uh, components. And we mentioned that whenever you look at these particular gadgets or devices, what you actually are doing is uh, saving content on a more permanent basis uh, uh, as far as um, that uh, computing infrastructure is concerned. The last session that we had, we discussed uh, firmware and uh, we mentioned that this is uh, typically hard-coded software that is normally uh, incorporated by the manufacturers of given hardware devices. And uh, uh, this particular software is literally stored on another type of storage component, which we uh, mentioned as uh, ROM or read-only memory uh, uh, storage. And obviously what the name would say is you can typically just access what is stored there. You can't uh, literally change without obviously using, without obviously uh, you, uh, you using specialized uh, techniques and gadgets and devices in order for you to obviously uh, erase or reincorporate content on these particular uh, storage uh, components there. So in today's session, if I was to just uh, maybe share my screen here so that you we just revisit some of the content and obviously understand exactly where the co whole concept of motherboards is uh, coming from. So if you look at um, uh, the shared screen there, I think it's important to identify and realize the fact that when we were going back to the whole concept of a computer system, if you remember, we mentioned that um, your computer uh, is uh, literally made up of an abstract part, which is your software, and you also have uh, a physical part, which is ultimately uh, your hardware. Like we mentioned before, a couple of uh, moments ago, two interrelated, one can typically not uh, exist uh, without the other. But if you remember well, we mentioned the fact that uh, your computer system should be able to obviously uh, provide, excuse me, look at some kind of input. Uh, we can discuss your process. Uh, we can also look at an output. Um, you might want to also uh, look at storage. Uh, 
and uh, lastly, uh, network. Right. So this is uh, uh, typically the whole concept of what is happening as far as your computing mechanism is concerned. So we've got several input devices, uh, several process uh, output storage and network, obviously from a physical point of view, uh, that are responsible for that uh, distinctive part as far as the generic computing process there is concerned. So with input, we've, we've discussed keyboards, uh, mice, uh, scanners are typical examples with processing. We've looked at uh, central processing units, GPUs, that's your graphics processing units, and also proprietary architectures such as APUs, which combines uh, both the CPU and the APU into one distinctive chip. And uh, uh, that is obviously uh, uh, distinctively associated with AMD. Then you've got your output, uh, your monitors, your speakers, uh, printers as typical examples. Not the only ones that are there, like we've mentioned before, but arguably some of the most common ones that you'd find as far as your computing mechanism is concerned. And then with storage, we've got that uh, subdivision we were talking about earlier on, which is uh, um, uh, your primary and secondary. Primary and normally associated with volatile uh, configurations, such as your uh, RAM components. And obviously, you're looking at storage of instruction sets that need to be executed by your central processing unit. And then uh, your secondary storage is normally look looking at mass media, where you're now storing content on a more permanent basis. And uh, it's, it's, it's arguably associated with non-volatile characteristics. And then uh, lastly, your network, which obviously enables you to connect uh, uh, a multitude of devices uh, with the associated peripherals, normally for the uh, purposes of sharing resources, both software and hardware related, and also uh, looking at uh, communication. So just uh, the whole concept of, 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 of sending and receiving messages uh, using the appropriate uh, signals or technology in general. So uh, um, uh, in essence, like we were mentioning uh, a couple of uh, moments back, you've got all these hardware devices that are responsible for uh, uh, these individual uh, stages. But remember, they have to be they have to connect somewhere because uh, naturally uh, your CPU has to be plugged somewhere. Your keyboard has to be plugged in somewhere. Your printer has to be plugged in somewhere. Your RAM has to be plugged in somewhere. Your hard drives have to be literally plugged in somewhere. So in essence, what uh, provides that convergence point uh, or that conversion, uh, convergence point rather is uh, uh, your printed circuit boards or uh, your motherboard. It, 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 its main purpose is to enable connectivity of all those devices we were talking about early on because without uh, a, a motherboard, then ultimately there's no way that we can have your CPU connected. Uh, we can know there's no way we can have that same CPU uh, a link to your RAM. Uh, we can there's no way that we can also have uh, your peripheral devices or your input output devices uh, are connected accordingly. So in essence, what provides for the connectivity of all these hardware devices would be uh, literally your PCB or uh, uh, your motherboard. So your printed. Uh, circuit board or uh, your distinctive uh, motherboard. So this uh, particular component's main purpose is to provide a convergence points for everything. So like we said before, with your input, you've got your keyboards, they plug into the motherboard. You've got your 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 mice, they plug into the motherboard. Same difference would go with your, 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 your process where you've got your uh, central processing unit, GPU and APU as typical examples. They all plug into this motherboard. Same difference would go with your monitors, uh, um, your speakers and your printers for the output uh, uh, stage there, um, and uh, obviously your your storage and networks, your network interface cards for argument's sake, and then your storage, both uh, primary and secondary, are availed for in terms of connectivity by this distinctive board. So in essence, uh, uh, it, it provides some kind of cornerstone when it comes to your computer system or provides a foundation for the actual PC and uh, uh, your motherboard's main responsibility is to act uh, for, uh, as that convergence point that we were mentioning earlier on. So when you're discussing the whole concept of motherboards, I think what um, um, you're distinctively supposed to take into consideration is that uh, uh, motherboards look at two distinctive uh, uh, features, you could say, or two distinctive entities in terms of what they're all about. Uh, when it comes to the computer system. You've got what they call the chipset, which we've discussed when we mentioned uh, your firmware, and then also what is known as the form factor. 
All right. So uh, whenever you discuss motherboards or whenever you bring about motherboards, um, these two particular terms uh, are literally also interrelated. Your chipset's main responsibility is obviously to provide for compatible CPU and RAM configurations. So um, your motherboard chipset uh, typically determines the type of uh, uh, CPU that you can plug in um, or the type of CPU that you can use. And at the same time, it also uh, determines uh, um, the type of RAM as well as the amount of RAM that you can plug in, excuse me, as far as your specific machine there is concerned. That's the chipset's main purpose. And if you remember what we mentioned before, chipset was initially subdivided into uh, two distinctive parts, your north and south bridge. Uh, so earlier machines would have a north and south bridge or two separate chipsets or two separate uh, chips that represent the chipset at large. And your north bridge's main responsibility was to typically provide for uh, connectivity to the fast components uh, associated with your uh, machine. And normally that would be your RAM and your graphics. So they would have a closer uh, link to your central processing unit because they need uh, the attention of your central processing unit a lot uh, 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 faster. Um, or they literally take precedence. And then uh, your South Bridge's main purpose was to provide for connectivity to your input output devices. So that obviously your input output ports to deal with your peripherals, uh, you, you, with such components as your keyboards, your mice, uh, hard drive, uh, optical drives, and so on, would then uh, um, use that particular part of the chipset to look at connectivity to the machine itself or literally the connectivity or link uh, uh, to your uh, uh, um, uh, to your uh, central processing units. So I think if you remember, I think uh, when we're looking at 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 when we're discussing the whole concept of firmware, if you go back to that uh, distinctive uh, uh, clip there, we mentioned that you've got your central processing unit there, and then uh, normally you had uh, um, your north bridge. We'll just uh, um, label it as an NB there and SB for south bridge. These would all be connected directly um, to your central processing unit. So naturally, your uh, uh, south bridge connects to the CPU through your north bridge. And what we were mentioning is that your uh, north bridge's main uh, purpose there was to connect uh, or link RAM and your graphics. And then on the other hand, uh, your south bridge was just looking at your input output devices. So. Uh, devices, ports, whichever way you look at it, that's what your South Bridge uh, was responsible for. But now with uh, modern machines, the whole um, aspect of uh, uh, the North Bridge has now been directly incorporated within your central processing units. So normally you'll find that on, on later day boards or modern boards, your uh, uh, boards will just come with one distinctive chip that would represent the chipset, which is uh, typically your South Bridge. Um, why? Because now uh, uh, integrated graphics and obviously your integrated uh, memory controller uh, uh, chip conventions uh, or memory controllers in general have been incorporated within uh, modern central processing units. So naturally now what you will distinctively find is just a CPU that would uh, uh, typically link to your, uh, uh, um, your South Bridge. And that particular South Bridge now is not coined as a South Bridge, but uh, typically a platform controller hub in general. So uh, PCH is what represents what the, the South Bridge was known as a couple of uh, years ago. Uh, initially, you'd have you'd had uh, Intel uh, labeling theirs uh, ICH, which is short for Input Controller Hub, and then AMD would label theirs uh, FCH, which is short for Fusion Controller Hub. But again, uh, both these institutions now just uh, generically coin your uh, distinctive uh, uh, Southbridge as a platform controller hub. So this now is uh, distinctively identified as a uh, PCH, which is short for platform controller hub. And like I said before, the whole concept of your Northbridge has been plugged in directly into your uh, uh, CPU conventions there. So your, your, your um, uh, uh, chipset's main responsibility when we're discussing motherboards is just to look at uh, a definition of the type of processor and RAM that the actual motherboard requires and uh, uh, to a certain degree looking at uh, uh, what built-in uh, devices that the motherboard actually supports.
including your expansion, uh, the expansion slots. I think we mentioned the expansion slots before, and we mentioned the fact that uh, uh, the moment you want to extend usage of your computer system, you normally uh, want to plug in expansion cards in these particular slots. So normally you'll find that uh, most of these boards would come with uh, onboard ports, which means that you're looking at ports that are already fixed onto the board, but you might uh, discover that some of these ports might have uh, distinctive limitations in terms of uh, uh, um, architecture. So you want to probably add in a separate uh, or dedicated graphics card you might want to also do the same for a sound card or uh, extending the amount of uh, uh, USB ports that you've got or input output ports that uh, are incorporated on your machine. So normally you would use these expansion slots uh, to uh, then plug in these expansion cards that will then enable uh, extension of uh, your or expansion literally of your computer system in terms of the amount of ports and architecture that you can use. So uh, technically uh, you're also looking at the chipset defining support uh, for those uh, uh, extra components that you've uh, typically uh, uh, plugged in there. Because remember, uh, those components literally determine the core functionality of the actual system itself. So the two biggest uh, uh, um, brands when it comes to your, your, your distinctive chipset there uh, in terms of manufacturing configuration uh, would be uh, Intel and uh, um, AMD, obviously not the only ones that are in existence, but uh, literally they're the ones that uh, are looking at um, uh, d providing uh, chipsets for both desktop and laptop conventions as far as your uh, environments there um, is concerned. On the other hand now, when you discuss a form factor, this literally just determines the shape and size of the actual uh, computer system that you'd use. So um, a form factor uh, deals with uh, uh, shape and uh, distinctive size of your machine. Mm, of your computer system. That's the main purpose of having um, your uh, form factor incorporated there. The different form factors that exist that also determine, obviously, uh, the shape and size of what is happening as far as your uh, specific uh, machines they are concerned. So naturally, uh, it's not just a question of, especially when you're looking at upgrading your 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 uh, motherboards, uh, for argument's sake, it's not just a question of just going out there and getting anything that you find. But obviously, you need to make sure that it's compatible with either the, uh, the box that you've got currently, or if you're buying something uh, uh, new completely, you still need to understand specifically what type of box uh, or tower that uh, this particular uh, motherboard would typically uh, uh, plug into. So there are several uh, form factors that are out there as far as your specific uh, setups they are concerned. I think if you were to show um, basic representation of what is happening here, uh, let me see if I can uh, share another screen here. So a typical example of what um, your boards would uh, distinctively look like, it's something along these lines. So what you find on screen there is a typical example of what a, tip, uh, a basic uh, board uh, uh, would look like. I think we've, we've discussed uh, these boards before, especially when we're looking at uh, uh, where to plug in your RAM and where your central processing unit sits and so on. Uh, that's a typical example of what a modern day board as far as uh, basic uh, uh, setups they are concerned. But remember, it didn't just, uh, um, the computer systems, literally didn't just arrive at these types of boards. There was a graduation in terms of the shapes and sizes that were there, and ultimately also specifically understanding exactly why there was a need for uh, changes as far as these particular boards and obviously the type of uh, connection points they would uh, typically provide for. So the first type of um, uh, board really that uh, was literally relevant when it came to your motherboards was uh, what you see on screen now, which is uh, the AT board or the AT form factor. And uh, um, um, AT actually is short for advanced uh, technology. And uh, uh, this was developed um, way back in the, uh, in the 80s, as far as your specific uh, setups are concerned. But obviously, as you can see, 
there are a bit of uh, uh, limitations there in terms of this particular type of board. Uh, it was quite a large board, um, but again, limitations and obviously the onboard ports that were availed for as far as this particular uh, basic uh, setup there is concerned. So if you look at your uh, um, top left corner there, there's a keyboard slot that uh, was used as the basic uh, um, onboard port as far as this particular form factor is concerned. Because remember, when your computer systems were initially designed, the sole um, means of input, really, or the sole input device was uh, distinctively your keyboard. So that's the one that would obviously have uh, a dedicated uh, connections with uh, an obviously a dedicated controller as far as um, that particular input device uh, there is concerned. But obviously, uh, in terms of uh, uh, limitations, I think one of the uh, greatest uh, problems associated with AT boards is uh, naturally the lack of external ports, like I was mentioning earlier on. And uh, um, that uh, obviously presented quite a, a massive um, hindrance in terms of, of, of usage of the computer system. Because remember, you've got a whole host of peripheral devices now that we're using. So keep the keyboard is not the only uh, type of component that you'd want to plug in. You can discuss uh, the, 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 the monitors that we were also mentioning a couple of uh, moments back. So initially, when, when these PCs were, in, were first invented, the only devices plugged into that average uh, PC with the monitor and the keyboard, like I was mentioning earlier on. Um, so th that's what the, the, the AT was designed to handle, just uh, your, your keyboard and the actual monitor itself. So it obviously have uh, an actual dedicated port as far as, as, as that uh, setup is concerned. But obviously over the years, um, multitude of devices were then uh, created. So when it came to AT, you had the, the generic AT that you find on screen there, and then you also had the baby AT, which is a, um, a, a smaller version of your generic AT, but arguably provided one the same thing in terms of functionality. So if you look at what we've got on screen now, you've got a baby AT board incorporated on top of uh, uh, that or uh, uh, shown on top of uh, your generic AT, just to show you the differences in terms of, 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 of uh, basic shape and size when it came to these uh, distinctive form factors. So to now accommodate for um, obviously the, the uh, myriad now of, 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 of uh, devices that are used uh, as far as basic uh, machines they are concerned. A different type of board was uh, designed um, and uh, typically a lot of uh, um, companies or institutions within the industry leaned towards this particular board because it provided for a whole lot in terms of uh, external ports when it came to uh, configuration of your computer system was the ATX board. So graduation from your generic AT was the ATX board. Remember AT, we mentioned that your AT uh, is initially short for advanced technology, and then ATX uh, is short for advanced technology extended. So um, it got off to a bit of a, a, a slower start because like we've mentioned before, I think when we were discussing RAM, uh, when we looked at uh, uh, the, the initial the differences uh, or similarities, whichever way you want, you want to look at it, between Rambus and DDR, we mentioned the fact that, uh, remember, Intel initially uh, subcontracted Rambus to create uh, a RAM module that uh, could accommodate their quad pumped uh, FSB or front side bus. And uh, Rambus obviously uh, uh, showed up and they, they, they created an actual RAM uh, stick at that time that could handle uh, 800 megahertz as far as your basic uh, speed uh, conventions there were concerned. So it was quite a brilliant stick at that time. But um, the, the, the problems was were problems that were literally experienced was that uh, Rambus was expensive uh, in terms of, of, of uh, the actual architecture itself. And at the same time, they were overwhelmed, you could say, because there were, they were uh, massive delays in the way in which they would uh, roll out these particular RAM modules. So to um, probably alleviate that kind of discrepancy, um, you find that uh, AMD and the rest of the pack uh, literally uh, um, lean towards a different architecture, which, which in essence mimicked um, what was happening with Rambus, but uh, the, the DDR was a lot cheaper. And obviously the RAM modules or the architecture itself uh, 
was readily available. So the rest of the industry literally leaned towards um, your 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 um, your DDR, and that's the reason why we're literally using those particular RAM modules uh, today, as far as your computer systems they are concerned. So it's arguably the same thing if you're going to be looking at it from an ATX platform. That obviously you had also a, a BTX, uh, and unfortunately BTX. Uh, didn't get too much clout uh, because, uh, again, the industry literally leaned more towards ATX boards uh, or the ATX form factor. And obviously, that's the one that you'd find that is uh, uh, literally the most common one when it comes to your towers or computer systems or your desktops uh, in general, as far as your uh, uh, setup there is concerned. So your ATX typically overtook um, AT and it's been dominant in the industry for a couple of years, really. Uh, and the typical example now of what your ATX uh, board or your earlier ATX board uh, 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 looked like is what you've got on the screen. I think we've we've shown images of this before. Now you can see that you've got uh, um, your external ports that uh, can accommodate for more devices as far as uh, um, your computer system is concerned. Uh, remember, you initially had dedicated printer ports. That's the pink port that you find there that is enabled as an external port, or that is uh, literally uh, the more dominant type of port where you've got the external port label that is there. But obviously, as, as architecture uh, typically uh, um, advanced, you now have your USB slots as your default go-tos when you're looking at uh, plugging in multi multiple devices. So your universal serial bus would then be responsible for connecting keyboards, uh, mice, uh, printers, uh, scanners, speakers, uh, headsets, the list will go on and on. So uh, initially you had dedicated uh, keyboard and mice uh, PS2 ports but uh, obviously now uh, those have become obsolete and overtaken by uh, your USB uh, setup that is there. So you've got a myriad of uh, uh, connection points that are there. Your North and South Bridge are still incorporated. Remember, this is an early uh, uh, type of ATX board that you've got incorporated there with the later day ones, like we mentioned before. You only now have uh, the South Bridge incorporated within your uh, um, uh, motherboards because North Bridge uh, architectures that have been plugged in directly into your uh, central processing unit. So that's what a typical um, ATX board would distinctively uh, look like. And you, if you were to look at uh, uh, the actual external ports, remember we mentioned the fact that your AT's main problem was that there was no external ports um, associated with uh, its uh, making. So if you look at the external ports that uh, you now have uh, got on the screen currently, um, like I was mentioning earlier on, uh, dedicated uh, uh, mouse and uh, keyboard ports, uh, your PS2 connections or your mini DIN uh, configurations. Now those have become obsolete because everything now literally uh, connects to your uh, USB uh, uh, slots there. And then you've got that pink port that you find your dedicated 25-pin uh, uh, printer port. Again, that has been uh, incorporated within USB DVI, uh, your VGA and your IEEE uh, 1394 connections. Uh, Firewire, also another term associated with that, not forgetting your audio as well as your USB inclusive of your network uh, uh, connections there. So that's a typical example of what ATX literally then provided for, but it's still in existence. Naturally, that's what we're still using now with your generic um, desktops. The only difference now is that you no longer have dedicated ports for uh, such devices as your printers, um, your keyboards, and your mice. Uh, literally, like we mentioned before, those now all connect uh, directly to your distinctive um, USB uh, conventions as far as uh, setup is concerned. So you also have miniaturized versions of this. Remember, we talked about baby AT. You can also even discuss uh, a micro AT, which is uh, also uh, inclined to uh, smaller versions of your uh, distinctive ATX uh, conventions there. Normally, the, the, the size for a typical ATX uh, motherboard is about uh, uh, 12 by 9.6 inches uh, as far as size is concerned. And then on the other hand, when you're discussing micro AT, um, the size that you're looking at is now uh, 9 by 6, 9.6 9 rather, by another 9.6. So it's uh, literally uh, a square uh, factor incorporated there. 
as far as your shape and size uh, is concerned. And then now if you look at the comparison um, between your AT and your ATX, you can, you can see the actual differences there when it comes to your distinctive uh, sizes, the amount of ports as well as architecture plugged in as far as uh, your distinctive uh, port uh, conventions there is concerned. So obviously avails for more in terms of uh, devices that can be plugged in and also uh, uh, more in terms of speed when it comes to the actual buses themselves as far as uh, your, your, your setup uh, there is concerned. And then if you want to look at a typical example of what a micro ATX uh, board would look like, um, you've got something along these lines. So this is a typical example of what a micro uh, ATX board would distinctively look like. So uh, 9.6 by another 9.6. And then on the other hand, if you were to go back to the previous slide uh, or previous uh, image there, that uh, generic ATX is uh, 12 by a 9.6. I think it's important for you to remember these sizes when it comes to uh, the distinctive differences between ATX generically and your micro uh, ATX uh, conventions um, that are there. Do you also find some uh, uh, distinctive examples? So this again is your uh, micro ATX uh, uh, that is there. So you you you'll also find that um, Intel the, um, in the late nineties um, also created their own variant of the micro ATX, and they called it the Flex ATX. Uh, motherboard and uh, normally it's it, uh, as far as uh, dimensions were concerned this one wow well, now rather was now nine by 7.5 inches and uh, 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 literally one of the uh, uh, smallest motherboards when it comes to the ATX standard uh, but uh, it's very rare for you to encounter these now I think uh, they, they've literally uh, um, disappeared off the face of the earth to, to, to a certain extent. They're no longer really being made uh, as far as, as, as uh, uh, conventions uh, um, they uh, would go. I think another type of board that you also might want to uh, uh, take into consideration is a board that deals with what they call a small form factor. Uh, so SFF, which is short for small form factor. Uh, these particular boards were known as ITX boards and uh, um, an organization or a company uh, called VIA is the one that was responsible for creating these smaller boards. Uh, you also have mini ITX as well, which is uh, 6.7 by 6.7 inches as far as uh, um, configurations would go. So in, in a certain extent, to a certain extent, you'll find that it's a it's a bit um, similar to your micro ATX. So what you've got on screen currently is a typical example of what a, a mini um, ITX would uh, uh, typically look like as far as your uh, setup is concerned. All right, uh, just excuse the uh, typo there right on top. It's supposed to actually uh, literally say mini ITX as opposed to mini ITX. Uh, so take that into um a consideration there. So these would obviously use a lot less power as uh, compared to their counterparts as far as your uh, specific setups are concerned. And the other thing is uh, um, when it comes to motherboards as well, you'll find that certain institutions, I think Dell, for instance, also would find their own type of uh, uh, proprietary uh, 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 motherboards or form factors or shape and sizes associated with their towers and obviously the uh, type of board that you'd use within it. And uh, more often than not, if you want to look at it from a basic point of view, um, these would obviously uh, stand out from the generic uh, setups that were there initially, but more often than not, it was also uh, a way to ensure that uh, should you need any servicing uh, any type of upgrade, you would then only deal with uh, authorized or registered dealers associated with these uh, distinctive institutions um, that are that are distinctively there. All right. So I think that's that generically covers um, what is happening as far as your uh, basic form factors there is concerned. And um, it, it's important just to realize and, and understand the distinctive differences there uh, between uh, chipset and form factor and what uh, these two uh, distinctive terms or architectures are literally responsible for when it comes to describing 
and uh, understanding exactly what our motherboards are all about. So I think it's very important for us to remember that everything that we've talked about so far, everything that we'll probably still talk about as well, I think obviously in the other sessions, we'll, we'll start uh, discussing your PSUs, your power supply units, as well as your uh, hard drives for argument's sake. All these components uh, uh, literally have some kind of convergence point, like we were mentioning right at the beginning of the session, that convergence point is your, your your ports or your connection points, which are literally uh, availed for by uh, the motherboard. So if the motherboard does not exist, uh, you cannot use your central processing unit, neither can you use your uh, input output devices, uh, neither can you use your storage devices when it comes to both primary and secondary, neither can you connect to a network. So it's very important to realize and understand what type of uh, uh, core uh, function uh, your motherboard provides for as far as connectivity to your uh, computer system there is concerned. So again, with the uh, chipset that we were mentioning before, if you look at what we've got on screen there, typical example of your uh, distinctive chipset, that uh, PCH or platform controller hub we were discussing uh, uh, a moment or so back, uh, that is uh, um, literally just underneath that cooling uh, mechanism that uh, is there or the cooling fins that you find as far as your uh, specific uh, environment there is concerned. So normally you find that most modern boards, if not all modern boards now, come with um, just your uh, distinctive uh, PCH. Um, and like we've been uh, singing, I think for a couple of uh, uh, times now in this the same session, that your Northbridge configurations now have uh, literally, I would say this, the, you, the, the Northbridge is no longer there, like we mentioned before, it's already incorporated within your central processing unit uh, environments there. But now remember, they, they, when you deal with machines, uh, when you look at uh, an upgrade, it, it, you still need to find ways and means of connecting those older devices or older components, uh, normally known as legacy devices. So um, do you want to avoid a scenario where, uh, or initially in, in the whole ICT environment, it's, 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 uh, I think it's prudent for you to, or, or, or relevant for you to ensure that at least when you create new te techno or when you incorporate new technology, there's both forward and backward compatibility. So obviously you, you're trying to accommodate for those older devices or, or that older uh, technology that was initially incorporated. And what uh, uh, they did when they were designing and creating new boards is to incorporate uh, uh, a chip or integrated circuit that was uh, distinctively uh, um, designed to accommodate for those older or legacy devices. So remember any old technology or any, or any uh, um, uh, old uh, connectivity platforms associated with um, ICT are uh, dis distinctively described as legacy devices. So there was a distinctive chip that was uh, incorporated that you would literally work hand in hand with that chipset we were mentioning a moment back. Uh, so literally another, a third chip, if you, if, 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 you, if you must, that was known as the super input output chip. And uh, its main purpose was to uh, literally link um, or be able to work with legacy or older uh, devices there. So a typical example of what your, simple, uh, your super input output chip would look like is what you've got on screen there. That one labeled ITE is a typical example of um, your super input output chip. And like I was saying earlier on, its main purpose is just to uh, uh, enable you to work with legacy devices or older devices or older technology as far as your specific um, environments there um, are concerned. So um, you will discover that um, I think with, with, with later day boards, these particular chips might not uh, literally be present because of uh, the advancement in techno in all directions there. But uh, initially, uh, these were incorporated just to ensure that uh, at least there's some kind of connectivity with uh, older devices or technology as far as your uh, um, setups would, would go. So you find that some manufacturers would add this in, some choose to uh, leave it out completely as far as uh, configurations uh, are, are concerned. So I think the other thing as well that is distinctively relevant when you're discussing the whole concept of uh, the chipset is to understand uh, if you look to literally look at a block diagram or 
some kind of schematic that then enables you to visualize the what the chipset provides for how it connects to your your central processing unit how it also provides for connectivity to other devices as well i think when we were looking at a uh, firmware we looked at um, how uh, that chipset then links uh, the uh, cpu to all the other devices that you want to literally connect as far as your uh, computer system is concerned and then on the other hand if you want to look at it from a different point of view especially when you're discussing the whole concept of uh, schematics uh, something that you find on screen currently is a typical example of what uh, that would be so this is uh, uh, an example of the intel uh, z390 chipset block diagram and um, obviously looking at eighth and ninth gen uh, intel core processors as typical examples uh, with your uh, UHD graphics there, uh, connectivity to the actual chipset itself. So when you look at the, the chipset there, uh, you've got optional connection points that are, the, 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 uh, are labeled um, by that particular legend there. But as you can see, you've got your processors linking directly to your RAM there, which uh, in this particular instance is your DDR4, and you've got uh, a speed of about 2,666 uh, megahertz. Um, so as you can see, direct linkage to your RAM now, which, which again, like we mentioned before, is replacing the actual uh, setup associated with uh, the initial Northbridge conventions. And then on your left-hand side there, you've got the same uh, uh, setup associated uh, in terms of graphics, where you've got uh, uh, connectivity there to your uh, uh, graphics uh, associated with your PCI uh, or short for peripheral component uh, interconnect platforms. So your, your, your CPU now handles uh, Northbridge conventions. And then on the other hand, uh, when you look at your generic chipset, you've now got connectivity to your input output ports, uh, USB or otherwise. Uh, you also have your 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 um, high definition audio incorporated there. Should you need to incorporate a redundant array of inexpensive or independent disks, uh, which is your RAID technology that uh, normally is associated with uh, trying to safeguard any uh, stored content from 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 corruption uh, or damage, uh, whichever way you look at it. So it's just a, a backup mechanism that is incorporated there, both on a software and a hardware level, to try and safeguard any stored content on uh, your hard drive. So obviously your motherboard has to be capable of this uh, for you to be able to undertake as well as accommodate for both software and hardware related uh, uh, RAID. Uh, so it's just a, a fault tolerant architecture really that tries to safeguard against any stored content. So just in case you lose any data that is stored or just in case uh, uh, that data is damaged, uh, naturally what you can do is always uh, um, uh, reconstruct that data from, from backups that have been incorporated there. So that's a typical example of what that uh, provides for. But I think the main thing to focus on really when it comes to that diagram is just the way in which your CPUs would then connect uh, to your RAM on your right hand side there and that same CPU connecting to graphics on your top uh, uh, left as far as, uh, as as conventions would go and then when you come down to your uh, Intel Z390 chipset um, specifically there I think the concentration is looking at uh, uh, connectivity to your input output ports um, so obviously uh, when you look at, at the left hand side you've got your USB, uh, PCI uh, express uh, uh, connections there, uh, even your network connections are incorporated as far as that particular setup would go. And at the same time on your right hand side um, you're looking at uh, your, your high definition audio there as well as wireless and Bluetooth connectivity as far as your setups is concerned. I think the other thing is that's also important is a direct connection to that firmware that we were discussing in last week's session. And uh, this just gives you an idea now the relevance and how important uh, a firmware actually is when it comes to uh, functionality as far as your computing uh, mechanisms uh, there are concerned. So obviously the extra devices that you can also discuss there such components as uh, your extra USB ports, for instance, uh, connectivity to both front and back USB ports, 
when it comes to your uh, uh, mobile motherboard or printed circuit board, uh, sound, uh, networking, a typical example of uh, additional connections there, video, the RAID we were discussing just now, uh, as well as uh, case fan support, which is also relevant as far as uh, um, your configura configurations would go. I think what is also important to uh, distinctively take cognizance of is the um, expansion bus. And remember, uh, this expansion bus is um, just a connection channel. Connection channel. Remember, every time we talk about buses, we've mentioned that a bus is just a connection point or connections channel, rather, or communications channel, if you look at it from a different point of view. And uh, um, the, the, these particular slots and literally accompanying wires, uh, uh, support chips on uh, the actual uh, uh, first PC and on the latest and greatest PC. Uh, whichever way you look at it and uh, these particular this particular bus is called your expansion bus the one that actually links or provides a connection uh, to your um, expansion slots and these slots are the ones that you would use so if you were to go back uh, let's see if we can uh, uh, quickly go back to one example of our uh, um, boards here yeah? uh maybe this one yeah so if you look at 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 the white slots that you've got there on on on, on your right hand side when you're looking at the atx uh board those are typical examples of uh, what an expansion slot would look like so you want to plug in a dedicated graphics card there or plug in a dedicated uh, a sound card it all depends um what you're actually looking at in that particular instance is an, it, you need an expansion bus that then connects those new components that you've plugged in to the rest of uh, the computing component. And arguably, if you want to look at it from this particular uh, example that we've got, uh, you actually have a proper label of what the PCI slots are all about. So you've got those four slots that are there. Again, you can plug in, um, you, can, you can literally populate all four of them with uh, dedicated components uh, dependent on what it is that you want to plug in. So the example that I was using uh, a moment back was a dedicated graphics card, a dedicated sound card. You can also even plug in, uh, uh, for instance, a wireless uh, adapter card there, a TV tuner card. You can also even plug in, uh, for instance, uh, uh, extension, a USB uh, port uh, extension uh, a card that is there. So if you want to plug in more, or if you want to utilize more USB ports, you can also uh, plug in uh, a card that accommodates for that. Obviously, you need just to take into consideration the the, the power usage of uh, these dedicated uh, components that you're now uh, distinctively plugging in. So on on the other hand, there has to be a way in which uh, this particular. Um, so if you go back, or rather go forward to what initially so we're discussing that all right so what you want what you see now uh, on on the screen is uh, um, a typical example of uh, that expand those expansion uh, 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 bus configurations and expansion slots uh, connecting directly to your cpu and then also having uh, those expansion slots connect directly to your uh, to your chipset but remember buses deal with speed or communication channels excuse me, regularly deal with speed, right? So we discussed the system crystal before, and we said that this particular uh, component, the quartz oscillator or the system crystal's main purpose is to uh, uh, determine the actual speed of your board. So the speed at which these sig electrical signals are sent to and from devices is typically de uh, determined by this uh, distinctive com component. So we've got a system crystal that determines the actual uh, uh, overall speed of, 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 of your uh, uh, board in general. And then you've got an, an expansion crystal now that is supposed to accommodate for your expansion slots. So remember, these new devices that you're now plugging in need to also have some kind of mechanism that uh, um, determines at which speed that they run at. And uh, what you've got on screen there is uh, an expansion uh, uh, crystal for your uh, distinctive expansion slots that connect either directly to your uh, central posting unit or uh, again same conventions would apply for these expansion slots that would connect uh, uh, to your uh, distinctive uh, chipset so uh, these clock crystals literally are not just for the cpu and uh, uh, the chipsets at large uh, literally 
uh, every chip within your computer system has an actual clock itself or a clock wire and uh, 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 needs to be pushed by this particular clock chip uh, to, 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 to enable uh, uh, proper functionality. And uh, uh, this obviously also includes uh, the expansion cards that we were discussing uh, um, um, earlier on. So it's all about uh, standardizing speed uh, within your, your, your environment just to avoid any uh, uh, setups that is there because naturally these expansion slots normally run at much slower speeds than the actual FSB or your front side bus. Remember we mentioned that the front side bus's main purpose is to enable connectivity between your central processing unit, your memory controller chip and your RAM. So normally you might want to argue that that's a, a, a bus or a channel that is um, rather fast when it comes to your computing mechanism. But at the same time, when you discuss expansion slots, um, that uh, speed might not be uh, that high. So you normally you find that uh, these expansion slots would run at much slower speeds than the actual FSB uh, um, that is there. So to, to, to accommodate uh, or to try and, and, and make sure that at least some of these expansion slots or the expansion bus uh, uh, itself runs at speeds that are relevant when it comes to your uh, computing mechanism, um, Intel introduced what is called the PCI slot or the PCI uh, bus. And uh, uh, this uh, PCI is short for peripheral component uh, interconnect. So it's, it's a, a, a literally uh, a, a platform that was uh, initially designed. So I think if we go back, let's see if we can go back to our uh, um, our slides here. Yeah? Right. So to accommodate for um, uh, these speeds, what uh, uh, Intel did. So Intel literally then. Uh, designed uh, the PCI. So uh, if you go back here, so Intel literally designed uh, the PCI uh, bus and uh, PCI is short for peripheral uh, component uh, interconnect. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the PCI uh, bus that obviously would work with uh, PCI uh, slot conventions as well. So uh, back in the early 90s and uh, um, uh, literally the graduation um, was incorporated, obviously uh, dependent on the actual uh, speed as far as uh, configurations they are concerned. The actual PCI itself provided for a much wider and faster and literally more flexible alternative than any previous expansion bus that was initially there. So you might want to argue that PCI literally changed the game in the way in which your expansion slots as well as the expansion bus uh, was incorporated within uh, your, your, your um, computing mechanism because the speeds were rather fast and the bus itself was wide enough. Uh, initially uh, uh, sitting at about 32 bits and uh, running at about three, 33 megahertz. At that uh, point in time, early in the early 90s, that was quite uh, fast. And it kept on uh, graduating in terms of, or advancing in terms of uh, uh, configurations as well as uh, capabilities and speed itself. Obviously um, for laptops, uh, you've got a mini PCI on the other hand that is used uh, for connectivity. And uh, as far as the actual graduation is concerned, uh, you can discuss uh, what they call PCI Express. So you also would find uh, um, the graduation of, of this generic PCI was uh, um, your PCI Express. So I think uh, the most important one that you would uh, want to uh, discuss there is PCI um, Express, uh, which is uh, shortened PCI uh, E. Um, so it's still PCI, but now instead of providing a parallel connection, remember parallel looks at shared communication or shared comms. That's the reason why normally you'll find uh, parallel is a lot uh, slower when you compare it to serial communication, because uh, with serial there's dedicated communication or point to point comms. There's no sharing of that link or that line. That's the reason why it's uh, literally faster. So it provided for uh, point to point serial connection 
uh, as opposed to initially what PCI generically provided, which was um, a shared parallel uh, communication as far as uh, uh, setups is concerned. So more or less consider looking at that 32 bit that we we're discussing earlier on uh, moving from one particular device uh, to the CPU in uh, one chunk of uh, data as opposed to uh, um, different pieces associated with your with your environment. So one of the advantages is that PCI did not share the bus itself. And at the same time, a PCI device had a direct point-to-point -point connection to the central processing unit. So you can imagine um, that, 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 that massive uh, leap or that massive advantage that uh, this particular uh, architecture literally provided for, that you, you don't have to have a go-between. You link directly to the central processing unit, which means that um, you've got faster execution of anything. And then at the same time, there's no sharing of uh, a communications line there. So it means that uh, uh, com communication literally was dedicated in that uh, distinctive environment. And uh, normally you find that these PCI controllers or devices are uh, identified as, as lanes. So again, mini PCIe at, at the same time also created for your a laptop uh, conventions there as far as your uh, setups are concerned. So this is all to do with the expansion bus and ultimately how you can connect those new devices uh, that we were talking about earlier on, or you can extend uh, your computing uh, system to accommodate for more uh, functionality. Now, when you're looking at installation of these expansion cards, right, when it comes to the board, so if you're discussing um, installation of these expansion cards, so installation of... Um, Installation of uh, expansion and a few expansion cards. Uh, you need to take into consideration uh, four distinctive steps or stages. The first thing that you need to uh, uh, take into consideration there is that you need to be knowledgeable about the device itself or about the component that you want to plug in. So the first stage is uh, being knowledgeable about the actual uh, device there, uh, knowing specifically what uh, device you want to work with and how compatible it is with an already existing system. Remember, it's not just a question of buying a, a card and just plugging into uh, a vacant slot, but it, it, it also looks at uh, compatibility, knowing exactly the capabilities of your system and what this new component uh, uh, literally provides for. So you need to check um, uh, in terms of, 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 of uh, the whole concept of uh, compatibility. So literally being knowledgeable about the device itself. The second thing rather you want to also look at is the actual physical installation associated. Uh, so physical um, installation here. All right, so the, the, your uh, uh, incorporating content accordingly, trying to avoid um, um, such uh, issues like uh, electrostatic discharge, because that could detrimentally affect your given component. So you know you need to know specifically how to handle the actual component accordingly without uh, distinctive problems, and then uh, slot it accordingly within the actual uh, um, connection point or slot itself without any discrepancies. Remember, you really need to use any amount of force uh, when it comes to installation uh, of anything, especially from a hardware point of view when you're discussing computing, because everything is, is designed to slot in where it should. So the moment you discover yourself using excessive force, that might already be an indication that uh, that particular component either does not plug into that uh, distinctive port or slot or uh, connection point, or you're doing it incorrectly as far as uh, your um, installation is concerned. So it's important to understand that you, I think the main thing is uh, uh, plugging into the correct slot and to also ensure that uh, you avoid electrostatic discharge or ESD uh, as far as uh, um, your uh, components they are concerned. Because like we said before, um, your, your, your electrostatic discharge would detrimentally affect uh, your machine. Normally any component that is affected by ESD uh, literally needs to be uh, replaced in its entirety. So you want to avoid that. And I think it's also important to remember the fact that whenever you're working on a computer system, regardless of how small the actual job might be, when it comes to you opening a case and plugging in or plugging out content, whichever way that uh, you're looking at, uh, you need to make sure that uh, um, the PC is always unplugged uh, from your power.
before you uh, insert any uh, distinctive uh, component there, especially your expansion, uh, your expansion card. So just make sure that uh, the power has been plugged off completely just to avoid any uh, discrepancies there, because again, that could detrimentally affect not just the card itself, but the board as well. So you might find yourself having to actually replace an entire computer box uh, or tower or, or computer system at large, uh, just by uh, uh, not uh, following those uh, uh, basic uh, steps as far as your, your, your um, uh, configurations there um, would go, all right? And then uh, the other thing that you also want to take into consideration as the third uh, step there is to incorporate uh, your drivers. Remember, we've mentioned drivers before, and we uh, uh, said that these are uh, software packages, we literally, that are stored on your hard drive that enable your uh, CPU to talk or to learn about a specific device. So obviously, every time you boot your machine, those drivers are loaded into RAM so that the CPU can access that content or that uh, particular uh, file. And uh, it uh, uh, literally enables the CPU to know specifically how to talk to or how to link to a, a given device. So every component, every hardware component, they obviously need a set of drivers that would function accordingly, uh, uh, especially on top of uh, a given operating system or on uh, within an operating, uh, specific operating system environment just to avoid any uh, uh, discrepancies there. So when we're discussing the whole concept of firmware, we did uh, visit and talk about what's happening with drivers and, and, and how uh, these particular drivers are incorporated accordingly uh, when you're discussing the whole concept of um, your computing mechanisms there. Um, so you can either uh, look at, 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 at installing your drivers from scratch if this particular component uh, it's obviously a new component. If you're upgrading, uh, literally, it's just a, a, an issue of you uh, removing old drivers. But again, it's important for you to make sure that you um, also take um, heed of the rollback drive part that uh, enables you to go back to a previously installed driver just in case the new driver gives you starts giving you issues where your system probably starts working or functioning intermittently um, uh, because of the new driver that is there. I think we've mentioned the fact that these drivers are normally uh, signed uh, when they are tested accordingly. Uh, there was an organization or setup that was there rather that was known as the Windows Hardware Quality Lab um, that was responsible for testing these particular drivers and then giving them a digital signature. So that signature or digital uh, 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 platform would literally uh, be a sign or an indication that this particular driver has been tested. It's, 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 there are no known issues associated with it, and it's safe to install. Uh, it doesn't literally mean that unsigned drivers don't uh, function, but they could cause system instability at any particular point in time. So they are not uh, um, something that you want to uh, I literally look at uh, uh, using as far as your machines are concerned. So just on, ensure that um, you use the, the appropriate driver as far as your setups are concerned. So that particular hardware quality lab now is associated with the term Windows hardware certification program. And that's the one that is responsible for giving drivers digital signatures, just to mention that, uh, or just to indicate that they have been tested accordingly without issues. And then obviously the fourth thing that you want to uh, distinctively look at when you basically are dealing with physical installation is then to verify functionality. So after you've uh, looked at uh, you understanding what the actual component is all about, your knowledge, uh, uh, physical installation, uh, incorporating the appropriate um, drivers, then you obviously need to verify that the actual device functions properly without any uh, distinctive problems as far as your uh, environments there are concerned. So uh, when you look at it from a different perspective, the uh, typical examples of looking at things like up updating drivers, especially when you access it through what they call the uh, device manager, you'll have uh, something along these lines. So if you were to switch back to the images that we've been incorporating here, um, 
So that's a typical representation uh, within your device manager environment where you can look at updating uh, a device driver um, or uninstall a device, whichever way you want to look at it. And remember, uh, these particular uh, uh, drivers, like we said before, are rather delicate entities uh, because if they are not incorporated accordingly, then it means that you lose functionality of your machine, or not of your machine rather, but of the component, um, or um, you've got minimal functionality of that component, or you've got intermittent functionality of that component. That's the reason why I was mentioning that it's important to incorporate the right driver, and uh, again, to ensure that that particular driver uh, uh, has been incorporated accordingly without any uh, uh, specific uh, uh, problems or has been tested accordingly just to ensure that everything uh, runs without uh, problems there. And then um, when you look at uh, what you've got on screen, that's uh, typically known as a standoff. And uh, uh, these particular components, they are there to um, uh, in, in ensure that uh, your motherboard is plugged in place and it's, it, it holds accordingly on the actual um, uh, case itself. So normally you will discover that uh, um, that these standoffs uh, screw into the bottom of an actual case itself, and uh, they're the ones that uh, literally this is where you actually plug in your board. So they create a bit of a space between the actual case itself and uh, um, the actual motherboard for cooling purposes, um, and ultimately just to ensure that everything is incorporated accordingly without any uh, uh, distinctive problems. So normally when you insert an actual new board. Uh, you mustn't assume that um, you will put in screws and, uh, and standoffs in the actual same place uh, as the old board that you had incorporated there. Some might differ, so it's very important for you to make sure that uh, there's some kind of compatibility that is there uh, 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 to incorporate uh, uh, that uh, specific uh, setup that is there. All right. So just to avoid that your motherboard becomes loose or your printer circuit board is loose, uh, those particular standoffs need to um, align accordingly with the new board that you've got uh, incorporated there. And obviously with the other connection points that you can discuss, things like your LEDs. So uh, your lighting that would show uh, hard drive activity or that you show that the power is on or that will show that uh, you've got connectivity to a network in some instances and so on. And um, these are all availed for by uh, connections to the actual board itself. So things like your soft power button, your reset button, your speaker, your power light, uh, the hard drive activity light that we were mentioning a couple of moments back, a USB a sound and uh, uh, Thunderbolt as typical examples, all need to be connected to your board uh, first before you obviously can 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 utilize these accordingly uh, on board or otherwise. So uh, normally you find that as far as your boards are concerned, uh, what you find on screen is uh, these are the connections where you plug in. They're actually even labeled accordingly. Uh, where you've got IE, uh, IDE, which is short for Integ Integrated Drive Electronics, uh, uh, LED, you've got your power, you've got your speakers there, uh, uh, reset buttons and so on. All these are plug in accordingly without uh, 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 distinctive issues, but you need to make sure that uh, you plug them into the right spot in order for you to then utilize uh, the, these accordingly, especially when you look at uh, such components or connections as your front um, uh, USB uh, 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 ports, for instance, they, they would need to plug in directly into uh, uh, these uh, uh, ports. So it's important to 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 uh, understand and obviously take uh, cognizance of. And obviously, when you're distinctively looking at plugging them in, uh, this is a typical example of how you would plug those uh, 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 connections or how you incorporate connections accordingly there as far as your distinctive setup is concerned. All right, so I think one of the other, the, the last thing that we want to uh, also look at is uh, the whole issue of troubleshooting boards, understanding exactly what to look out for and what could be uh, uh, distinctive causes that are associated with your uh, uh, environment. So a typical example of uh, some of uh, the issues that you might find. So if we were to go back uh, to our set of slides here, Uh, let's see if we can quickly go back to our slides. Uh, 
So when you're looking at uh, the whole concept of uh, troubleshooting your boards, so here we can mention as uh, basic... Uh, um, troubleshooting um, other boards. What uh, you obviously need to look out for is the actual uh, symptoms. All right, what are these uh, uh, symptoms as far as your uh, board configurations is concerned? So normally you've got three types of these. Uh, you've got what they call catastrophic failures. So uh, there is what is known as a catastrophic uh, uh, failure associated with your uh, uh, motherboard configurations. Normally, this is, uh, is, is, uh, is something like that you'd find as uh, maybe dead on arrival, where the computer system just, just doesn't work. A typical example of, 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 of uh, uh, catastrophic uh, failure uh, configurations there, as far as your uh, specific environments are concerned, where the machine just, just doesn't boot as far as your specific setup there is concerned, obviously the best way to deal with such a, a, an issue or a problem is uh, to look at uh, um, a replacement of your distinctive uh, board in its entirety. The other thing that you also want to discuss is component failure. So uh, in essence, the catastrophic failures can also be associated with uh, a burning failure where um, that ESD I was mentioning uh, a, a couple of moments ago can then detrimentally affect uh, uh, components. I think the, 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 most, the, the best thing that you do is just to replace it accordingly without any, uh, any issues. Remember, you've got warranties also associated with these components. So again, without having to look at any uh, intricate uh, um, setup or configurations there, the best thing that you want to do there is look at uh, replacing. Then you can discuss, um, you can also discuss um, component failures. All right, and obviously as far as component failures are concerned, um, it's, 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 it's not as common as um, uh, you would, as it would seem, because these are intermittent problems. So normally you might find that um, um, it's it's a it's a it's a faulty connection. Um, so normally you might things like your hard drives or your optical drives might uh, literally be connected to a faulty controller on the actual board itself. So um, it might show in your BIOS that uh, this particular device is connected, but then when you access it from within Windows, for for argument's sake, uh, you find that uh, it's not accessible. Uh, uh, typical other, other examples can include USB ports as well, that uh, it, it, it worked uh, for, for a while and then all of a sudden that uh, USB port, not component, but USB port in terms of uh, the actual connection on your board is, is not functioning accordingly. Um, so typically it, it, these are all examples of, of, of uh, component failures that are there. Um, ways and means, you can look at um, replacing component. I think this is where your expansion slots now come into uh, uh, come into play here, where you find if you've got faulty USB ports, uh, you can just plug in uh, an expansion card that uh, accommodates for, or that enables connectivity of these ports. Same difference would go with things like graphics cards and uh, uh, literally um, your, your, your uh, sound cards. But I mean, a rule of thumb when it comes to such components like your motherboards, the moment they start functioning intermittently, as long as it's not functioning 100%, I think the best thing that you want to do there is literally um, uh, replace it. And then the third thing that you also want to discuss is what they call earth ethereal problems or failures. And then uh, obviously when it comes to these, uh, um, normally, uh, you find that the PC just reboots um, by itself naturally. Uh, you get your uh, BSOD or your uh, 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 blue screen of death when you're when you're running very uh, resource intensive tasks. Um, and uh, causes of of these particular problems can include things like a faulty component, uh, uh, a not so functioning device driver. 
um, application software that is not functioning accordingly, uh, power supply problems uh, or, or corruption in your OS. These are all examples of uh, the causes of uh, these type of problems. And uh, um, your guess obviously is as good as mine when it comes to this. And again, the best way to, to look uh, uh, through that is naturally uh, looking at uh, replacing your, your, your keyboard because you might look at, okay, look, let me um, reinstall my driver or let me look at uh, reinstalling my application software, uh, reinstalling my OS, um, check what's happening with my power. But you obviously still get the same problems. Again, like we were mentioning earlier on before, uh, the best thing that you want to do in that environment is just to accommodate for uh, replacing your drive, just to avoid any, or replacing your, your, your motherboard rather, just to avoid any distinctive problems associated uh, with that. And obviously to, to avoid any problems that can arise in the long run, as far as your specific machining mechanisms there are concerned. All right. Um, I think that does that, that does that rather for your uh, motherboards there. I'm going to quickly unmute here. Uh, if there's anyone who's got uh, any distinctive questions uh, that are relevant to what we've just discussed, feel free to uh, do so. Um, so uh, do we have any questions, contributions, um, or concerns from the floor when it comes to PCBs or motherboards? Any questions, contributions, or concerns from the floor there? Sir? Yes, sir, man. Uh, sir, um, you said uh, regarding the catastrophic failures on the motherboard, you said that you had to replace the entirety of the motherboard. Uh, yes. Are there no chances to, you know, maybe like uh, repair it? Just, you know, maybe so, some, so, uh, okay, a yes, faulty yes. section okay. instead of the whole motherboard. All right. So normally what happens is, remember your board is, 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 is one entire unit. So that's the reason why we were subdividing these into uh, uh, component catastrophic and obviously uh, uh, ethereal uh, 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 failures. If it's a component <laughs> failure, for instance, like if it's a faulty connection or ultimately, um, so if it's a faulty connection um, that you, you're having in terms of, 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 of uh, like we were saying earlier on, your hard drive, your hard drive uh, or your optical drive and so on, you can, you can literally get uh, instead of replacing the entirety of the board, you can li literally get an expansion uh, card that can uh, accommodate for that, right? But then when it comes to a catastrophic failure, these burn-in failures means normally you find it's dead on arrival, like I was saying earlier on, or ultimately you find that uh, uh, the, the board itself doesn't just, it doesn't work in its entirety. There's no way you can replace a specific, or you can, you can uh, try and repair, repair rather a specific section of that board. The best thing that you'd want to do with a catastrophic failure is obviously replace the board in its entirety. But if it's a component failure, then naturally you can say, okay, look, I'm having a USB slot or USB port rather that is giving me issues. My best thing, uh, uh, thing in, term, in terms of uh, um, troubleshooting instead of replacing the entirety of the board is buy an expansion card that has USB ports, plug it in and then use those USB ports instead. So there's a difference between catastrophic and component. If it's component, you're good to go. But if it's catastrophic, then naturally you've got uh, uh, um, no other um, option but to replace the board in its entirety. I'm not so sure if that answers your question there, Amon. Uh, that answers my question, thank you, sir. Okay, cool, not a problem. All right, so um, anyone else with uh, questions or contributions or concerns there in terms of uh, the boards? Questions, contributions, or concerns? All right, um, so it seems we are good to go there. Um, look through, uh, it should be, um, this should be chapter six, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in your uh, prescribed textbooks. Please look through that chapter. Uh, should you still have any questions, um, as usual, please pop me a mail and then we can engage ourselves on that platform accordingly. Otherwise, I think we're good to go when it comes to uh, motherboards. I think the next uh, thing we should be discussing in tomorrow's session is going to be power supplies. So also, uh, please uh, peruse through that chapter as well so that um, when we pop in for, say, for sessions, most of the content that we'll be discussing becomes uh, familiar territory.
and it's a lot easier for you to understand what's happening there. But if there are no questions, contributions, or concerns uh, from the floor, I think let's call it a day. Uh, stay safe. Thanks for attending. Uh, we'll see you in uh, tomorrow's session where we'll be discussing. Actually, we'll be discussing, um, instead of moving on to power supplies, I think we'll look at um, uh, safety and professionalism. So we're going to be discussing operational procedures, I think, in tomorrow's session. And then uh, sometime, is it next week or the week after, we'll then look at uh, PSUs before moving on to your hard drive. So tomorrow, actually, we're going to be going back to chapter number one in your prescribed textbook, which is uh, um, your safety and professionalism. If you're using uh, the ninth edition, that's going to be operational procedures, which is chapter number two. And then... Uh, um, after that, we'll then engage within uh, with the other chapters, uh, seven and onwards. All right. Okay. So uh, uh, stay safe. Uh, thanks for attending. Um, cheers. Right, uh, Kateko, you've got your hand up there. Um, what's your story? Is that a question, contribution, or concern? Um, say, so is this video recorded or not? No, it is recorded. I'm going to post it on um, on the YouTube channel. So if you check your chats, let me just put it in now. Uh, give me two seconds. Yeah. Um, Right, so if you check your chats, I've just uh, uh, posted a link there. Uh, give it about um, probably about 30 odd minutes, probably by the time we, we, we start uh, the, the, the next session at three for, for, for help desk, I'll, I'll have uploaded this on, on, on this particular channel here. You'll find all the other um, clips associated with computer architecture and the other modules as well on this uh, link here. So give it about 30 odd minutes, I'll have this uploaded. All right, uh, Kateko. Yeah, so yes, uh, I think we see, we we're having a problem with with because uh, you can go ahead and speak and unmute yourself. Um, otherwise, you can type in chat there. If you if you're having problems with with um, with your mic and so on, you can just uh, type it out in chat and then uh, take I'll take it from there. Sepo, any other questions there or contributions? <laughs> 
No sir. Okay, cool. So that's that then. Um, right, we can take. I think maybe pop me pop, pop me something in chat there. Otherwise, uh, pop me a mail. I think we're having some kind of connectivity issues. Um, all right, all right. So let's go to the day, guys. Uh, again, thanks again for attending. We'll uh, see you in tomorrow's session.